besting your forefathers, politics and hive designs. Join me as I talk about bees and honey in antiquity on the Ancient History Hound podcast. Hi and welcome, my name's Neil and in this episode I'm turning the clocks back in more ways than one. Roughly six years ago I decided to start a podcast. Originally it was called Ancient Bloggers Podcast which I then rebranded to Ancient History Hound. I think the title is a little bit clearer about what it's all about. What I've done is rewrite and re-record the first episode I ever did which was on bees and honey in antiquity. Initially I thought it would be well a simple job however that was certainly not the case. As mentioned, I've pretty much rewritten all of it with a lot of new content. In the episode, I'll discuss how honey was made, in short, apiculture in Egypt and Mesopotamia before finishing with the Greeks who as ever have a lot to say about it all. In case you're wondering why I haven't included Rome, well, there's only so much I can cram into an episode, so perhaps in the future I'll do something just on them. In fact, that feels a very Roman way to do it. Now, I'd like to say thanks for all the nice emails I've received and the reviews as well. Don't forget, you can leave a review on Apple and Spotify for the podcast, as well as individual episodes on Spotify. If you listen through any other platform, feel free to rate or review if you can. I know I say it every time, but it really helps with getting more visibility to essentially what is an indie podcaster with no marketing budget. There will be episode notes on ancientblogger.com, that's my website, with a transcript, some of the images I talk about and anything else I think will help, and that will include a reading list of the sources I've used and cited. If you want to find me, I'm on X as Ancient Blogger and Hound Ancient for the podcast. I'm also Ancient Blogger on YouTube, Instagram and TikTok. It's all ancient history content there, by the way. Now, there are a couple of tales about honey in antiquity, which I've covered in the mini-sode Mad Honey. Safe to say that it wasn't always a good idea to to take honey for granted. So if you want to hear about that, then you can easily find that episode. It's a mini-sode, so short and sweet, if you'll excuse the pun. Okay then, I'll begin. The early evidence of a person collecting honey, at least in terms of an image, is found on a cave near Valencia in southern Spain and dates to 8000 BC. The image is a simple one. A figure holds onto some vines with their left hand, with an object in their right hand, and around them are bees. It's more probable that this was a person collecting wild honey, that is to say, a nest which had grown naturally and not as the result of a man-made hive. It makes absolute sense that people back then, as I'm sure they do today, would have chanced their arm, literally so, collecting the sweet stuff and perhaps suffering a few stings for their effort. In order to find the earliest instances of apiculture, that is, humans keeping bees, we need to move forward a few thousand years and travel east to the other end of the Mediterranean. We start then at Egypt and a temple to Ra, which was built by a pharaoh called Nasiri Ini. Apologies for my pronunciation, by the way. His rule dates to around 2500 BC, and the temple was one of many buildings he constructed, including three pyramids. And to get some perspective using pyramids, the famous Great Pyramid at Giza had only been built 100 years or so previously. The temple to Ra featured many reliefs, and in one of them we have a scene which is the earliest known where honey is being farmed. On the left, a figure crouches next to what looks like a wall with small indents in it. We'll come to that in a moment. On the right of the scene, Other figures stand and are pouring what is presumably honey into containers. A large bee hovers nearby. The crouching figure at the far left is attending hives, and here we meet our first thing of note. Hives, for much of antiquity, were horizontal cylinders. Though there was a variation of this, which I will come to later, the premise of the horizontal type was simple. A cylinder with a hole in one end for the bees, and a lid in the other end, which could be removed and allowed the worker to access the honey. Unlike the figure in the cave, here we can be sure that a process was in place which allowed people to harvest honey. And the fact that it was a temple to Ra is also apt. According to Egyptian myth, bees were formed from the tears of Ra. We meet a more spectacular depiction around a thousand years later. It was found in a tomb, but not of a pharaoh, instead a governor called Rekmire. Perhaps that actually undersells Rekmire, 
He wasn't an average official, but a very senior one, and his tomb showcased his many, many titles. The scene, again one of many in the tomb, features two individuals. One kneels, and another stands over him. Both face three unusual shaped objects. They're stacked upon each other, and look like cylinders cutting half. That is to say, one end is rounded, and the other is a flat, vertical front. You've probably worked out, as per my comment a few moments ago, these are hives, and the kneeling figure is removing small oval objects from the hive and placing them in a bowl. These are the honeycombs. The figure standing up holds a bowl, and the artist has painted wafts of something coming from it. This has been suggested as an incense burner, and from this it's been posited that this was acting as a smoker. Now it makes sense, one person collecting and the other using a smoker to lull the bees whilst they do so. A very interesting argument has been made on the back of this image, or rather using this image to support it, namely that the act of smoking bees, which is, as I mentioned, done to calm them down, may have evolved from the act of burning incense as an act itself of reverence to the bees. The docile behaviour of the bees as a result of this was understood as the bees accepting and being pleased by the offering. The argument then speculates that this was a possible origin for how smoking came to be what it is today, that is to say a technique used to calm down bees. However, given that an object identified as a smoker has been found in central Greece and dates to around 3300 BC, it's likely that this was a strategy used long before the relief depicted it. It's entirely plausible that it preceded apiculture, and perhaps the Egyptian act of smoking bees was aligned with their view of the bee as holding some divine status, or at least to be respected. By the time of Rekmiri, apiculture was big and an important business in Egypt, and the roll call of officials responsible goes some way to underline this. As far back as the First Dynasty, a period from around 3100 BC to 2686 BC, the fantastic title of Sealer of the Honey was used. Naisuri Ini had an individual called Naikara serve under him, who was called the Overseer of All Beekeepers. Chief Beekeeper and King's Acquaintance was inscribed on a scarab seal dating to sometime around 1800 BC and this belonged to a person called Intef. This small object goes some way to evidence the bureaucracy within the industry at Egypt. And of course, there were scenes on the tombs mentioned. These don't just show honey being collected as a singular event. Instead, the scene is set within the context of what we might realise as a supply chain. It was collected, sealed, stored, and then presumably moved to locations where it was used. The uses for honey in Egypt at this time were, well, numerous. Obviously, there was the taste. It was a natural sweetener. And I'm very partial to a dab of it in my coffee. I've actually got one now. Just not too much, though. That's in case my dentist is listening. However, there was one other major use of it in ancient Egypt. Medicine. The ancient Egyptians were renowned for their medicinal skills, and honey formed the basis of many treatments. The Cahoon, Ebers and Smith papyri documented over 900 treatments and 500 involved the use of honey. Take, for example, the use of honey as a contraceptive when mixed with natron and crocodile dung. This instance is one of the more well-known examples and was recorded in the Cahoon papyri which dates to 1900 BC. The Ebers and Smith papyri date to a few centuries later and here honey was used to treat wounds something which honey is apparently well suited to do, though please don't try this at home. Other uses related to helping respiratory problems, digestive issues, and even parasites. Thinking about it, honey must have seemed a wonder. It could be used for pretty much anything, mixed with lots of things. Even a side product, beeswax, had uses, from a binding agent on bandages to giving a wig perfect curls. The ancient Egyptians weren't the only people to realise how useful honey was, and one of their great rivals, the Hittites, also took it seriously. These were a people who rose from their base in what is modern-day central Turkey to form an empire which expanded down the Levant, covering parts of modern-day Syria. References to honey are largely contained in the writings of the Hittites, specifically their cuneiform tablets. 
In tablets dating from 1650 BC to 1500 BC, the market value of honey was established, as well as the penalty for stealing hives. This was now a fine of six shekels of silver, but previously it had been punishment by bee stings. Hittites also used honey much as the Egyptians did as a sweetener. It was added to wine and beer, and along with olive oil, made a basic sauce for frying meat in. It was also present in at least 13 types of bread. Honey was burnt as a fragrance and used for ritual purposes. A newborn baby would have its tongue wiped with honey to get rid of a curse, and it was further used in other purification rituals. It was even used to tempt a god into their respective temple by being mixed with other ingredients and spread on the roads leading towards that temple. The relationship between honey and the divine didn't stop there. According to one myth, the mother goddess Hanahana sent a bee to find her son, which it successfully did, even stinging him into returning. So far, we've seen that the Egyptian and Hittites viewed honey as a much-needed commodity, and one which they created infrastructures to support. But what we lack at this point is something more tangible, something which can evidence how it all worked. And at a site in modern-day Israel, we have just that. The site is known as Tel Rehov and is found in the Jordan Valley. It occupied a strategically important location, both on the north-south route and the east-west route. This was no backwater, and by the 10th century BC had grown to become a major city controlled by Egypt. It was here that an apiary, that is, a set of beehives, was discovered and this constitutes some of the oldest finds we have for hives and honey production. The apiary itself is within a collection of smaller buildings, which presumably facilitated the production and storage of honey. However, the area where the hives were found was one and a half metres lower than the surrounding rooms, and it's been speculated that this was to keep the bees away from the other rooms and the nearby buildings. This wasn't a rural facility, it was slap bang in the middle of the other buildings of the city. In the lower area, the cylindrical hives were arranged in three parallel rows. Each row formed of at least three tiers of hives that had been stacked on top of each other. The rows had two aisles between them, 1.2 metres and 1.85 metres. Perhaps think of a supermarket with shelves and aisles. It was something like that. The hives measured roughly 80 centimetres in length, with a diameter of 40 centimetres, this gave them a volume of 56 litres. Each one had an end with a small hole between 2 and 4 centimetres wide, which allowed the bees in and out. The other had, an, had a lid with a handle at the end, which could be removed so the honey could be gathered. Now, there was some real ingenuity here, because the hives on either side of one of the aisles faced with their lid ends inwards. This meant that workers in that aisle could access the honey from the hives either side of them. There's evidence that the hives were covered, but this area doesn't seem to have had a roof, which makes sense given that the, well, the bees would have been flying about. Not all the hives were found. The site seems to have been partially destroyed in the 9th century BC. However, it was estimated that 180 hives could have been in place here, and from this we can start to speculate on just how much honey was produced. The estimates are that each hive could have supported 10 to 15,000 bees and could produce between 3 to 5 kilograms of honey a year with between 0.5 and 0.7 kilograms of beeswax. Even with the middling figure of 100 hives, that's 300 to 500 kilograms of honey a year, a huge amount, and one which can only evidence an industry level output. This wouldn't have been for local consumption, although obviously some of it would have been eaten or used. The fact that the apiary was within the city and not outside of it also points to the value. Presumably, this location kept it secure. We might now reason that the lowered floor here acted in a way to focus the bees rather than have them flying around too much, again, if they're in the middle of all those other buildings. In following work at the site, there was a discovery with huge implications. Within one hive, pieces of a bee were found in some charred material. A session with an electron microscope later, the species of bee was identified as the Anatolian honeybee. In many ways, this makes sense. The Anatolian honeybee isn't very aggressive and it's very productive. 
Today, it's the backbone of the Turkish honey industry, which is second only to China in honey production worldwide. There we go, there's a bit of trivia for you. The curious part of this, as you may have noted, is that the Anatolian honeybee wasn't native. The local variant, the Syrian honeybee, is apparently less productive and more aggressive. So it made sense because, well, more production and presumably fewer stings in that built-up area. But also, imported? Did this mean that this sort of thing could happen? That apiculture was advanced to the level that non-native bees were picked ahead of the native ones and then moved perhaps hundreds of miles to a site? If so, then this evidences a high level of apiculture. And this level of aptitude in apiculture was something you might want to boast of. On a near Assyrian stele dating to the 8th century BC, a ruler of Suhu, an area in Mesopotamia, boasted how he had reared bees for honey, something his forefathers had not been able to do. The ruler, an individual called Shemesh Resh Asur, again apologies for the pronunciations, went so far as to state that he had brought bees from the Habhu, and this has been argued as the Zagros mountain area in Iran, or the eastern Taurus mountains. This is roughly 400 kilometres. So perhaps there was a separate import-export industry for bees at this time. Mesopotamia had also been utilising honey for some time. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, which dates to roughly 2100 BC, the eponymous character offered honey to the gods when his comrade Enkidu died. Perhaps though, as per the previous example, apiculture was just a bit more sporadic. And this comes with a caveat that Mesopotamia was an area in which empires waxed and waned. I appreciate that it's unfair to give an over-generalised comment. It's plausible that apiculture wasn't as much of a thing here as it was elsewhere, because the landscape may not have supported large hives. As it's been noted, the large plain areas in Mesopotamia don't seem conducive to honeybees. We can therefore consider the boast of Shamash Reshersur in this context. That is to say, apiculture wasn't something easily done. It wouldn't make sense for Shamash Reshersur to cite this achievement if apiculture was a common thing here. That wouldn't have made sense. The final culture of people I'm going to discuss are the ancient Greeks, and it's fair to say that they had a lot to say both about bees and honey. I'll start with mythology and the Thray. These were three sisters, minor divinities, perhaps nymphs, who had wings and ate yellow honey, which afforded them the gift of prophecy. They lived on Mount Parnassus and would fly about, presumably offering their insights. Honey wasn't just used in myth as a needed foodstuff for seeing what was going to happen. When Zeus was an infant, he was hidden from his father in a cave on Mount Ida and Crete. Here, he was cared for by nymphs with goat milk and honey. According to Diodorus Siculus, who wrote in the 1st century BC, Zeus rewarded the bees by changing their colouring to what we know of today. Sadly, Diodorus didn't mention what the colours of them were before the makeover. The nymphs who had cared for Zeus were daughters of a character called Melissius, and the name Melissius translates along the lines of bee man or honey man. With the Thray and Melissius, we have deities associated with the bee in some way. But for the ancient Greeks, there needed to be a mediating figure, someone who taught the ancient Greeks the art of beekeeping, and this character was Aristeus. His name translates as most useful or most excellent. And this is very much the case, because Aristeus was very, very versatile. His main role seems to have been a god of shepherds, but he also taught the arts of cheesemaking and cultivating both olives and hives. He was pretty much the expert in rural living. The Greeks seem to have woven aspects of bees and honey readily into their myths, and at one site this was manifested further. I'm talking about Ephesus. Ephesus sits in the west of modern-day Turkey. Though it is now six kilometres or so from the Aegean Sea, it was once a coastal place. Founded around the 10th century BC, it was most famous in antiquity for its association with Artemis, and in 550 BC, a wonder of the ancient world. The Temple of Artemis was built there. It hadn't always been the case. An earlier deity, Kabylie, seems to have been the previous deity worshipped there. 
So began a process common in antiquity when one deity is slowly replaced and morphed into another. This was made easier in some regards as Artemis and Kibele shared some aspects such as the close association with animals and motherhood even though Artemis was a virgin goddess. And it's worth pausing at this point to mention that deities often had different representations. Though the virginity element of Artemis was central to her, she was by no means the teenager on tiptoe with a hunting bow, which is often the image you find. At Sparta, for example, her worship could involve human blood, and in myth, she's linked to human sacrifice in occasion. If you want to learn more about this, then you can listen to the episode on her I recorded with Dr. Carla Ionescu. At Ephesus, the bee became an integral image. It featured on their coins and even entered the lexicon of the priesthood there. In Aristophanes' comic play Frogs, the poet Euripides mentions the bee nuns of the Temple of Artemis. We might think of them as priestesses, and they were known as melissae, or honey bees. One argument even suggests that the famous statue of Ephesian Artemis was linked to bees. If you've not seen it, it's instantly recognisable. Artemis is flanked by two animals, and she stands with her hands outstretched. Around her midriff are rows of small globes, and it's been argued that these are breasts, alternatively bull's testicles, have been suggested. However, it's also been posited that they represent or reference a wild honeybee nest. The idea behind this is that at some point the votive figure for Artemis would have been a simple wooden one. This was actually common in ancient Greece. The large marble statues weren't a regular thing. The argument supposes that wild bees attached themselves to the idol, a perfectly feasible event, and a nest resulted. The Greeks would have not likely removed this. Instead, they would have perceived it as divine approval. So it goes that the later globes are a reference to this, perhaps by this point the specific rationale forgotten, but still passed down as part of the original representation of Artemis there. The bee wasn't just linked to Ephesus. Elsewhere in Greece, it was an animal with many connotations, often good, but also not so good. Take this early example from the archaic poet Hesiod. In his work Theogony, the poet compared the hard labour of a bee and the lazy parasitic nature of a drone to men and women. In fact, I'll go ahead and quote it. All day long, until the sun goes down, the bees are busy laying the white combs, day after day, while the drones stay indoors in the covered hives and reap the toil of others into their own bellies. So did Zeus, who thunders on high, make women to be an evil for mortal men, grievous partners. The bee could represent more than the divine. It could be a way of commenting on the social and the political, usually at the expense of women. In the political sphere, the dynamics of a hive might be understood and perhaps not fully welcomed. In the play Persians, Aeschylus had the Persian soldiers akin to bees and Cyrus as the king bee. To set up of a hive, a number of workers, who had no say with a single individual in charge, must have wrangled. It was too much like a monarchy, something Athens of the classical period wouldn't have much been drawn to. In Plato's Republic, the drone is again mentioned. This time it is compared to the useless element of society, and the concept of the hive and honey is almost turned upside down. The son of an oligarch might turn into a democrat if he supped on the honey of the drone. Here we have sweetness and honey as dangerous, indulgent things. But of course, there could be no doubt that hives functioned effectively, and in Xenophon's Oikonomicus we find the bee as an aspirational figure, albeit one for a wife. If a woman became a queen bee in the household, she would run it very productively. She would ensure that the slaves worked properly and the house benefited as a result. It wasn't just Xenophon who held the bee in high regard and as a role model for women. The archaic poet Simonides of Amorgus wrote a poem describing the different types of women. Each was linked to an animal, and it's safe to say it has not aged well. It's possible that the poem was deliberately offensive, possibly for a ritual. Alternatively, it could have been written as a satire, a sort of archaic roast. However, it's far more likely that this was just in line with what others, such as Hesiod, thought of women. After all, Hesiod was writing at a similar time, 
That's not to say that the attitude to women particularly changed much in the later periods, by the way. According to the poem by Simonides, that man who has a wife akin to a bee is the most fortunate. He will have a bountiful household and handsome children. In addition, his wife won't be the type to hang around with other women gossiping about bedroom stuff. The other types of women, from those akin to the weasel through to the ape, do not have much in the way of anything resembling a compliment. Simonides, it's safe to say, was not a fan of women in any context. Moving swiftly from one archaic poet to another, there is a reference by Plutarch, albeit with a caveat that this is Plutarch writing many centuries later, involving Solon and bees. Solon was a reformer of ancient Athens, who was brought in to solve a crisis which was occurring there in the early 6th century BC. I talk actually about what he did and the challenges he had in the episode on democracy, so a bit of a plug there. In short, he tore up the social and political rule book and wrote a new one, which covered a range of topics. One of these, as Plutarch wrote, was that hives had to be 300 feet from your neighbour, or possibly your neighbour's hives. It might be that this was something Plutarch invented, but it, but it feels believable. If honey was an important commodity, then it would make sense that those involved in producing it would need some form of regulation. And it's not as if we haven't got evidence of beekeeping rules prior to this. And at one location in Attica, the region Athens controlled, we have boundary markers and land renowned for bees. The mountain range of Hymettus is to the east of Athens, and it was here that markings dating to the 4th century BC were cut into the bedrock. The hills of this mountain range were famous in antiquity for producing the best honey money could buy. Though no hives have been discovered there, it's plausible that hives were situated on it, perhaps temporarily and within the designated areas. Again, this is speculative, but we know that boundary markings were made here and that the area was perfect for bees, so, well, why not? We hear of honey in the plays of Aristophanes, who noted that the attic stuff was really expensive and it was useful in keeping screaming babies quiet. He also mentioned honey cellars, and according to an inscription dating to the 4th century BC, we even know the name of one individual, a woman called Pilamen. And we might think that the production of honey and its distribution involve various people in Athens at different strata of society. Though Athens doubtlessly cashed in on the honey trade, it wasn't the only place to do so. Travelling east across the Aegean Sea is the island of Agathonisi. In antiquity, it seems to have been known as Trigia. Both Thucydides and Strabo used this name, probably due to the large goat population there. On the north of the island is the site of Catraci, a fortified position dating at the earliest to the 4th century BC, and here a number of hives were found. Archaeologists also discovered extension rings. These are extra rings which could be used on the horizontal hives to extend the hive and increase the honey produced. One estimate on the study that I've included in the reading notes about this came to 1,000 kilograms of honey a year facilitated by these rings alone. Some measurements of the hives were able to have been taken and these indicate a hive of around 40 centimetres in length with a rim diameter of around the same size. The tubular design wasn't consistent and often narrowed in the middle. Though these dated to the 4th century BC at the earliest, there have been hives discovered such as the one at Vary in Attica, which was similar in size and shape. But what was also found here was a different type of hive, a vertical one. These resembled baskets or very big plant pots. There was a range of height from 29 to 45 centimetres and all had narrower bases. The bees were able to enter through a narrow hole near the base, and the lid was removable, perhaps being made of wicker or other materials. This type seems less common in ancient Greece. There have been others like it found at Isthmia in central Greece, and these date from the 3rd century BC. One suggestion is that this type didn't need to be stacked. Well, it couldn't be stacked, but it could be placed at an opportune spot and then removed. These also had markings on them, either denoting the owner or the potter, though one argument is that the wording reads public beehive, which presents a number of tantalising prospects. 
These findings illustrate an issue in trying to form a clear picture about beekeeping in ancient Greece, namely that there is a reliance on very perishable material to give us information. Pottery was famously reused. One apt instance is the use of two cylindrical horizontal beehives being placed with their lid ends together to form a makeshift coffin for an infant found at Marathon. But also, pottery was, well, you know, smashed and wasn't something which survived easily. And here it's worth mentioning the Mycenaeans, a people of ancient Greece in the second millennium BC. This was a hugely important civilization in the Aegean and would have doubtlessly have practiced apiculture, perhaps adopting what had been happening in Egypt. The difficulty is finding much to substantiate how it manifested exactly there. One set of vessels found on Crete have been argued as vertical beehives, and so perhaps these were more popular than we might think. And here again we meet the problem of relying on evidence which was unlikely to survive. As an example, it's thought that wicker baskets were originally used and that the ceramic vertical hives, the basket types, were just a more permanent version which followed. Wicker and pottery, not exactly the most durable of materials. Without more evidence, we can only speculate and move between points in time where we have something tangible, a sort of joining the dots across large spans of time. You might be wondering about ceramic hives and how good they were. Were they too hot or too cold? This was something the later Roman writer Columella considered, before reasoning that ceramic hives weren't actually that good. However, modern experiments using this material and a colony of bees in both types of beehive has resulted in a strong thumbs up. The hive in each was able to regulate temperature with no issue. But even then, there's that whole history of this type of hive being used for many centuries previously made of pottery. Perhaps it was a case of Rome just being, well, a bit Rome about anyone else and especially the Greeks. A writer who is a bit more accurate about things relating to bees was Aristotle. In his work concerning animals, he made a number of observations, including how bees carried bee bread on their legs and how the hive is formed of wax cells. Aristotle observed that the king bee only left the hive during a swarm. Now, you might not be surprised that the idea of a queen bee hadn't yet been fully realised. In fact, Aristotle goes on a great length to describe the structure of the hive and the division of work there. He even wrote about the types of danger a bee or hive might have in the form of disease, birds predating on the bees, or even the toad, which apparently loved eating bees and was the scourge of the beekeeper. In terms of the production of honey, Aristotle noted the different types of it and reckoned a hive could supply six to nine pints of honey with an excellent hive offering up to 12 or 15 pints. Though a range of plants were noted as supporting hives, thyme seems to have been a very popular one. Aristotle mentioned it, and it was featured in Theophrastus's On Plants, a famous work in antiquity. Here, the importance of thyme was noted, not just for it being a favourite of the bee, but also that beekeepers would know how much honey to expect based on how well the thyme in the area flowered. And with that, I come to the end of this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. And again, if you want to hear about the mad honey, don't forget to find that episode. It's certainly wherever you're getting this from, whichever platform that may be. And again, if you can rate and review, please do. Though more importantly, and as ever, keep safe and stay well.